Joe Biden is an elderly man with a poor memory. We may know that, but the left isn't quite sure of it yet. Make sure you pick up a T-shirt or a mug to show them exactly why you shouldn't vote for Joe Biden. StuDoesMerch.com. Use the code Stu10. Get 10% off. You should also check out the show on YouTube, youtube.com slash StuDoesAmerica. Make sure to like and comment on our videos. And let the algorithm robots know that you're alive and well. Uh, Jason Isaac is here to explain why Americans just aren't falling in love with electric vehicles. I've got a special preview of the brand new comedy movie for Blaze TV. Uh, you're going to love that. But we're going to start by doing Ronna McDaniel. Yes, Ronna McDaniel. We mentioned this a little bit the other day when it was breaking. But it is just a fascinating story. Ronna McDaniel was, uh, of course, the head of the RNC. She was uh, handpicked by Donald Trump to get that role. Uh, they, as, as ten, what tends to happen with Donald Trump occasionally, doesn't necessarily always stay in love with the people he's in love with. And uh, they've had a little bit of a parting of the ways. She was blown out of the RNC, looking for a new gig. And as is typically the case, when you have a disagreement with Donald Trump or you maybe are falling out of love with him, you tend to run uh, land a plush role over at MSNBC. This is kind of what they do. They pay you hundreds of thousands of dollars to potentially say some bad things about Donald Trump. And they're trying to make, uh, I, in theory, I guess the idea was to have someone who could at least explain or talk about uh, what Donald Trump was thinking, what his side of the story was, whatever. Um, you think you would need that if you're a major news network in a country where half of the voting populace is going to go probably vote for Donald Trump. Maybe someone on your network representing that view, if you're a, a nonpartisan news source, uh, would be appropriate. Ronna McDaniel uh, was the choice. She was getting paid $300,000 a year. And uh, now she doesn't have a job anymore. NBC News ousts Ronna McDaniel after network's anchors launch unprecedented on-air rebellion. And look, the weird thing about this whole story is, like, it's not like the, the right loves Ronna McDaniel. Like, if anything, she was seen as pretty ineffective at her job. She was there for the loss in 2018. She was there for the loss in 2020. She was there for an underperform in 2022. People weren't, like, in love with the job that she did there. And the fact that the MSNBC can't even put on somebody like that is just incredible. And, of course, this was all basically the anchors going on the air and, you know, bitching about their co-workers on air. This is, I, I mean, this is, I guess, what you do now. You, you don't like a decision your company's made. You go out there and you make a big stink about it. You don't just do your freaking job. You don't just stay out of it. You got to come out and be Mr. Loudmouth because, of course, your opinion is so important. How often, you know how often I see this stuff? I see it all the time. There's always some sort of drama going on, even on the right. Two people disagreeing with each other. This company's fired this person. This person's hired this person. I'm, I have bo I'm bored with all of it, frankly. I, I don't I really ever comment about any of it because whatever. Like, let the interpersonal squabbles happen if they're going to happen. But, like, I don't need to get involved in that. My life's complicated enough. You know, how, it, how do you get to look like this while at the same time eating Taco Bell three and four times a day? That's just, just that is complicated enough. I just stay out of that nonsense. But... Uh, MSNBC wanted you to know, the anchors wanted you to know they were mad that they hired a Republican-ish type of person. And uh, let me give you a, uh, some of the highlights of that nonsense. Uh, here's MSNBC, by the way, announcing Ronna McDaniel is no longer going to be working there. NBC News leadership has announced that former RNC chair Ronna McDaniel will not <gasps> be an NBC News contributor. Oh, my goodness. We have a new email and update that's come out just within this hour. So this what? is sort of breaking news here within our organization it's on a giddy. story that has garnered significant uh, attention and criticism. In this new email, quote, there's no doubt that the last several days have been difficult for the news group. Oh. After listening to the legitimate concerns of many of you, I have decided that Ronna McDaniel will not be an NBC News contributor. Oh, my gosh. He goes on to write that no organization, particularly a newsroom, can succeed unless it is cohesive and aligned. Over the last few days, it has become clear that disappointment undermines that goal. It's one out of a thousand people that go on the air at MSNBC that might have a moderately conservative opinion occasionally. 
They can, and they all just go in utter revolt. By the way, the uh, letter continued. I want to personally apologize to our team members who, have, who felt we'd let them down. While this was a collective recommendation by some members of our leadership team, I approved it and take full responsibility for it. I mean, really, are you taking full responsibility if you're at the same time blaming uh, a collective recommendation by some members of our leadership team? Are you? Uh, our initial decision was made because of our deep commitment to presenting our audiences with widely diverse set of viewpoints and experiences, which is not at all what MSNBC does, of course, particularly during these consequential times. We continue to be committed to the principle, but we must have uh, diverse pr- uh, viewpoints on our programs. And to that end, we will redouble our efforts to seek voices that represent different parts of the political, political spectrum. Let's see how, how much that actually happens. Now, this is all on the heels of a bunch of uh, people revolting on air. Let me give you some of that. Here is uh, a person who used to host uh, Meet the Press on MSNBC and then got demoted, uh, Chuck Todd. Look, let me deal with the elephant in the room. Yeah. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation because I don't know what to believe. She is now a paid contributor by NBC News. I have no idea whether any answer she gave to you was because she didn't want to mess up her contract. Mm. Um, she wants us to believe that she was speaking for the RNC when the RNC was paying for it. So she has she has credibility issues that she still has to deal with. Now, this is McDaniel after she was doing an interview with the new host, Wexler, uh, who and she said basi- basically, yeah, like, why did you deny the whole uh, election 2020 thing? And she said, well, basically, I worked for the RNC and needed to, you know, you had to take one for the team basically saying she didn't really believe it. She just said it because it was part of her job to say it. That's not exactly the type of person you want on the air. I mean, I, it's, it's as if they could have asked her that in the interview process if they really were concerned about it. Because I, I think it's legitimate to not, not want someone on the air who basically tells you, I didn't say the things I believed because of who I was working for. Uh, that's, you know, a whole nother issue. And, and, a, and a problem, let's say, throughout the industry. Uh, at times. Um, here is uh, Stupid Morning Joe uh, talking about this whole Ronna McDaniel thing. Let's talk about uh, the hiring of former RNC chair Ronna McDaniel. Well, uh, she was on Sunday's Meet the Press. It was her first appearance since the NBC, and since NBC News hired her as a political analyst. Uh, I know you won't be surprised to know that we've been inundated with calls this weekend, as have Uh, uh, most people connected with this network about NBC's decision to hire her. Uh, We learned about the hiring when we read about it in the press on Friday. Uh, We weren't asked our opinion of the hiring, but if we were, we would have strongly objected to it for several reasons, uh, including, but not limited to, as lawyers might say, Ms. McDaniel's role in Donald Trump's fake elector scheme and her pressuring election officials to not certify election results while Donald Trump was on the phone. It goes without saying that she will not be a guest on Morning Joe in her capacity as a paid contributor. Mm, Wow, that's really, really devastating. A devastating takedown. Almost Joe Scarborough intern devastating. Uh, But there you go. That one's down. And he also had Rachel Maddow and Joy Reid, who, I mean, you want to talk about, like, I mean, Joy Reid is probably the craziest person in public life. I, 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 there might be competition for that somewhere, but I don't think so. And Rachel Maddow, who knows what she's doing? I mean, Maddow's actually relatively smart, knows exactly what she's doing when she comes out and lies to you. Um, you know, Joy Reid is more of an idiot, I think, uh, so it's a little bit of a different profile. But let me give you the two profiles together, celebrating how this person that they never had to invite on their air at all no longer has a job. I just have to say, when somebody does the right thing, I feel like it should be acknowledged as publicly as we acknowledged our outrage. And so I I know how I feel about it. I am grateful to Caesar for actually making the right decision. I think it was the right decision. In our big company with all sorts of different journalistic entities, you have all sorts of different people working in this business, doing all sorts of different kinds of work. And to see the essentially unanimous (laughs) feeling among all the journalists in this building and all the sort of senior staff and all the producers and everybody in this building about this was one thing. But then to see the executives and the leadership hear that and respond to it and be willing to change course based on it, based on their respect oh, for God, us and hearing what we argued. Asses. I I have I, deep respect for that. Oh, I have deep respect. You, never, you notice that Rachel Maddow kind of looks like a giraffe? Has anyone ever noticed that before? I don't know if it was just that outfit, but she looks 
like her neck is approximately three feet long. Has everyone ever pointed this out? We need to get to the bottom of that. That's another investigation maybe for, uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, I don't know, the Enigma files. We'll get to that later, later on. Um, you know, look, the, the, I love the idea that, like, you're, you're revealing a bit too much when you know that every single person in your building, from journalists to hosts to producers, I assume to the people in the cafeteria, all oppose the hiring of the person who was leading the RNC. Now, look. Again, I have no special feelings toward Ron, Ronna McDaniel. I don't think she did a good job. I don't, I don't like the way she acted after the election or before the elections or honestly any of it. But, like, she's a representative of one of the two major parties, a pretty serious representative, someone who was handpicked by the current presidential nominee to be the head of the RNC. The fact that you couldn't find anyone in the entire building to think that was an okay hire, you're, you're admitting a bit too much here. We should point out, like, yeah, you know, like, I think you can get it on Ronnie McDaniel for some of the stuff she said in the past. But is any of it even moderately close to what Rachel Maddow did on the air every single night for months and months and months and months about Russia? Where all these things where she's been proven wrong a million times and never has really uh, come to the table and said, gosh, I really blew that one. Never. It's just been basically, I swear I was right. And then Joy Reid, who's bonkers insane, not to mention homophobic, is on the air every single night, too. And they never have to pay any price for that. But Ronna McDaniel, in a paid contributor capacity, again, a paid contributor is someone who can be important to the programming to add some color to certain shows. But it's not like a central decision uh, that you're making to form the network, right? Like, you can have people who disagree with you. We have people on the air all the time that disagree with us on certain things. Y you know, you, you want to have someone who's going to add uh, a little bit of color uh, to your broadcast, but, like, you can deal with a, a, a paid contributor that your network doesn't, you know, you don't agree with that's being paid by your network. I mean, like, get over yourself a little bit, giraffe woman. Okay, um, the question, I guess, is who, if not Ronna McDaniel, who? Who? Who are they going to have on their shows that is going to display an opinion that is represented by about half of America? That Donald Trump is maybe a good president or a good candidate. Why can't you find anyone who believes that, that you can put on the air? Isn't that kind of weird? I mean, you're, you've got a lot of money. You're throwing already $300,000 at Ronna McDaniel. I mean, like, uh, there's a lot of people who will come on your air for 300 grand a year. You probably will. I probably will. Oh, come on all the time. Come on all the time. $300,000 a year. We'll yell at each other and I'll go home. Uh, sure. $300,000 a year is a nice check to come on. By the way, in a contributor situation, you might not come on for weeks at a time. You might not do anything for weeks at a time. And by the way... Ronna McDaniel for, and I'm sure it's a tough week for Ronna McDaniel, but like at the end of the day, she's going to get paid $300,000 for nothing and probably sue for even more. Um, now, Fox News has liberals on the air all the time. They have lots of liberal contributors on the air. Uh, you know, like a lot of times they get beat up by the conservative hosts a little bit, uh, but, you know, they're representing their view and they do the best that they can. Why can't MSNBC come up with anybody who can do that? Um, you might not like Trump. I get it. Uh, but you should have somebody on the air representing at least some of his views, right? Like, this isn't a... I'm not asking for a lot here. It should be very easy. And remember, these are the people that are always trying to put the fairness doctrine back on talk radio. They always want, you know, fair views represented on both sides when it's on talk radio. But on their airwaves, they can't even find one person to qualify as an opposing view. And as soon as they find someone who might qualify, they get them fired after two days. If you can't find a single person that is going to represent Donald Trump and put him on your air, I mean, I disagree with Donald Trump on a lot of stuff. But we still find people who come on the air and, and, and are going to defend him and, and his record. It's, it's easy to do. It's really not difficult. If anything, you think Ronna probably would have wound up being critical of Trump. I mean, her, her first appearance was basically to say, yeah, I didn't believe the election was stolen. Something that she probably didn't believe at the time, but still was saying publicly, she obviously was showing she had a little bit of a distance between herself and Donald Trump. You'd think this would be the type of conservative they like. This is the conservative pipeline, right? 
You go, you, you say you're conservative for a while. Then when you uh, break up with your party or your nominee or your philosophy, you get a job at MSNBC. So you can be pushed up there. It's like, oh, here's a Republican. And they even agree that Donald Trump's Satan. Like that's the whole, that's how you get to get paid at these networks, right? That's the whole scam. Now, uh, Aaron Rupar, who's not exactly, a, you know, known for well, much, but also for his intelligence, uh, kind of responded to a point where Elon Musk made the same similar point I just made. Well, like, hey, you can't find anybody to come on the air. That's how biased, uh, you know, MSNBC is. They can't find any Republicans really to come on the air and defend Donald Trump. And Aaron Rupar responds, uh, Nicole Wallace, Joe Scarborough, Michael Steele and Charlie Sykes could not immediately be reached for comment. You see, because MSNBC does put those four people on the air. But what do you know those four people uh, for lately? How are they best known? Could it be that they're Republicans, in air quotes, many of them at least, who come on the air and constantly bash Donald Trump? Like, you know, searching the depths of the Lincoln Project to pull people on the air to, and co- to call themselves Republicans isn't exactly innovative from uh, MSNBC and certainly does not prove the point uh, Aaron was trying to make uh, there. Look, there are conservatives who don't like Donald Trump that are actually conservatives. I mean, we talked about Jonah Goldberg before. Jonah Goldberg's a legitimate conservative, has been for a very long time. His credentials are very, very strong. Does not like Donald Trump at all. Okay? Doesn't like him at all. And he could come on the air and still he'll still tell you taxes should be low, uh, but he'll also say he doesn't like Donald Trump that much. Fine. I mean, at least I can get something out of that. The people like, you know... Nicole Wallace is like a hardcore leftist at this point. The fact that she once worked for a Republican makes no difference at all. Joe Scarborough? Joe Scarborough was barely a Republican when he was in office as a Republican. Now? I mean, I... uh, He's turned into an obvious liberal and has been, you know, working to please the left for years and years and years and years. These people are jokes to the right. No one takes them seriously. No one would ever, ever nominate any of them to consider uh, and, and defend Republican principles. That's just not the way this works. Now, Ron McDaniel is going to sue for mental distress over the NBC firing. I don't know if she'll win that, but she'll probably get a bunch of money out of it. And honestly, after the way they treated her, they probably should. I mean, like, this happened with Kevin Williamson when he went to The Atlantic. He's a great writer, went to The Atlantic. Again, another actual conservative who doesn't like Donald Trump. You could put him on the air. They tried that. They put him over The Atlantic. But they found out at one point he didn't really like abortion all that much. So they fired him before he even started. I don't know how much he got paid. should have been more than it was. Uh, Trump uh, is mocking uh, Ronna McDaniel now after the uh, ouster from uh, NBC. Um, here's what he said. Wow, Ronna McDaniel got fired by fake news NBC. She only lasted two days. And this after McDaniel went out of her way to say what they wanted to hear. It leaves her in a very strange place. It's called Never Never Land, and it's not a place you want to be. These radical left lunatics are crazy, and the top people at NBC are weak. They were broken and embarrassed by low ratings, highly overpaid talent, bring back free and fair press, make America great again, 2024. So there you go. Of course, you know, again, it's, it's worth pointing out that he did hire her. He did pick her for this role, uh, but he's picked somebody else he likes better now. So that's where we are. Ron McDaniel outrage renews scrutiny of politics to pundit pipeline. This is actually pretty interesting because I don't think this is a great thing. Like if you're the press secretary for the president, your next gig probably shouldn't be in the media. In fact, it probably should, you should, it shouldn't be in the media for a very long time after that job, frankly. Your job is to deal with the media. And uh, honestly, like, despite the fact that some of the people who have made this transition I like, I just don't think it's a good transition. We shouldn't get in the habit of people in politics immediately going uh, to media right afterward and then acting like they're normal hosts. I mean, Sean Spicer is over at Newsmax. We've had Sean on the air before, but... You know, he's certainly a defender of, of, of Donald Trump, uh, Ari Fleischer and Dana Perino, both of which have good things to say. Uh, both are over at Fox. Sarah Huckabee Sanders uh, went over to Fox. Kaylee McEnany went over to Fox. Tony Snow back in the day went over to C- uh, CNN. Robert Gibbs, Josh Ernest over to MSNBC. Jen Psaki, of course, is at MSNBC now. And I guess there is a line, too, between hosting a show and just being a commentator. I, I mean, like Jen Psaki hosting a show and acting like she's a normal 
you know, she just left the White House. She was negotiating her deal with MSNBC while she still worked at the White House, while you were still paying her. And I will remind you once again, the press secretary job, not a job that is paid for by the president. Hey, go out there and defend me. It's a job paid for by you to get the best information from the White House. This is violated all the time, but that is the truth. Jay Carney, watch the CNN, uh, and uh, there you go. So uh, it's just amazing to see how far we've come. You can't find anybody on this side. Let me take you back a little ways. MSNBC wasn't always this way. Let me take you back to, uh, well, Rachel Maddow. When Rachel Maddow so per- popped on the screen, she was on David Letterman. Uh, after Letterman called Glenn Beck a loony, uh, this is the quote. For, this is a hilarious quote from Rachel Maddow. She says, it's definitely worth noting, though, that not only did Maddow not take the bait to bash Beck personally, she revealed her admiration for him. Before Glenn Beck had his TV show, I used to listen to him every day on the radio. I think he's the most talented the most talented radio personality of my entire generation. Now that he has his own TV show, he mostly talks about himself, which isn't as much fun. And then, of course, you could go back to, I mean, Pat Gray used to go on MSNBC all the time and talk about news and give a conservative perspective back in the day. Glenn Beck even did it. Here is Glenn back from 2003, kind of getting into a mini fight with Chris Matthews. If I'm asked to vote for Arnold Schwarzenegger, what I need from him, I need to know what the, the turning point is in his life. I need to know, you know, people don't change when things are great. They How change about 2002? Is that too recent? Pardon me? Is 2002 too recent? I, I, well, I don't know. I'd Frankie, like to see it? the turning point. I, I think it is. It didn't bother me. The stuff in the 1970s. Okay, come on. Who wasn't doing that in the 1970s? The, uh, you know, two years ago, that bothers me. But I, I just want to know what the turning point in your life. What brought you to Jesus, Arnold? What changed you? Well, you don't have to make fun of that transition because it's affected my life and probably yours too. Absolutely, so, it has. You don't have I'm to a make fun of Jesus. Man. I mean, I don't, I don't like that. But I, t- I seriously don't like it. But I think you're right about the main point you're making. Right. A bit sarcastically, which is you have to hit bottom. Right. And I truly believe right. you got to decide that this isn't working before you try something better. Anyway, we'll be right back. This guy's a great guy, Glenn Beck. When I come to work really late, I listen to the guy coming into work and I Glenn Beck from working out of Philadelphia, the author of The Real America about the Heartland. Uh, he's a great guy. I mean, MSNBC was calling Glenn Beck a great guy. And did you note the, uh, the, uh, the little fight there between them? The fight was because Glenn, he thought Glenn Beck was being too dismissive of religion. That's how far this has ha- come. In 20 years, they come to the place where, like, I think, if any, is there a person in the offices that even uh, would consider at any point even going to church, let alone actually defending religion on the air? Of course they would. Of course they would. They would all the, the biblical principles of higher taxes and social justice. I know they are defended occasionally on MSNBC. Bottom line is you're not getting the truth from MSNBC. I really didn't need 20 minutes to tell you that, but it is a fascinating thing to see how far they have gone. They have completely given up on the idea of representing the country and journalism as a whole. One thing I think we can agree on is uh, Glenn sure has aged gracefully. Now, if you have some medication that you need uh, and you need it in a hurry, you could just go and get it from a pharmacy, right? Well, that's not really been the case lately. In fact, there's hundreds of drugs that are in short supply now. Why? What country is this? Well, the vast majority of the medicine we take in the United States is manufactured in China. So if something goes wrong, who do you think is going to get the drugs that they need? Is it going to be you or is it going to be the Chinese people or whoever's paying top dollar? I don't know. If you want the ability to take care of your family's health so you don't have to worry about the I don't knows, you need the Jace case. It's a personalized emergency kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. Jace is always working to uh, add medications to their offerings. They've added ivermectin as an option in the, in the Jace case in case you need your horse dewormed. Because mm-hmm. that's the only use. We swear it's the only use. Just ask Rachel Maddow at MSNBC. Plus, you can buy a gift card for your family or your loved ones so you can get a Jace case for their own. You can get one for yourself. Just get one. You can get one in your house today because you don't know what is around the corner. JaceMedical.com. J-A-S-E Medical.com. Enter the code Stu at checkout, and you'll get a discount on your order right now. The promo code is Stu at JaceMedical.com. J-A-S-E Medical.com. 
I'm happy to welcome Jason Isaac to the program. He's a former Texas state representative and the founder of the American Energy Institute. Jason, thanks for coming on the program. It's great to be on, Stu. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to bring you on to talk about electric vehicles because when I watch the media, what I get is a kind of a pitch that says these things are exploding in popularity. Americans love them. They are excited about getting them in their garage as fast as possible. And we have to have this transition to electric vehicles as soon as possible, and maybe as early as uh, 2030 or 2032. Yet when I read the news about these companies, I see the electric vehicle startups are down 90 percent in their stock prices. Uh, all these big companies that are known for uh, for gas power vehicles are having really tough times making this transition. The demand does not seem to be there, even with all the government incentives. What's the truth? No, and you're right. The polling shows and it's showing that support for electric vehicles is waning, people's interest in them. They're basically the latest electronic gadget, although very expensive and heavily subsidized by you and me as taxpayers, ratepayers, and purchasers of internal combustion engines. Research I published last year called Overcharged Expectations shows that you and I are pitching in nearly $50,000 per electric vehicle sold. And I think people are waking up to this realization of how expensive they are. They're also seeing media coverage from Chicago when people are getting stranded in their electric vehicles because the charging won't work or they just can't find a place that does work, as was the case in Los Angeles when the media went out and did an expose on all the charging stations and found that over half of the charging stations just didn't work. So not everybody has a chase crew like Secretary Granholm that can run out ahead of her and block charging stations that work so that she's got a place on her road trip where she can charge. We don't have that luxury. Uh, I guess, unfortunately, our, our elected officials and those that we pay to serve us do. Maybe that's a new subsidy we can create, just like giving each American a person <laughs> to go out in front of them to block off charging stations. That's just an idea. Uh, we put that in the Business next opportunity for yeah. sure. <laughs> um, actually, I looked at your study and it's really interesting. You mentioned the $50,000 figure, which is incredible. And I look at this stuff a lot, but I don't remember ever seeing it this big because you have you hear a lot of you hear $7,500 a lot, $7,500. They will pay you $7,500 to buy a car. If you can't be successful under that model, you're not an actual business. Um, but it's much, much more than that. The, the $7,500 also goes to if, if you're leasing a car, plus individual parts manufacturers throughout the supply chain are getting other uh, subsidies to create the parts to put into the car that they're paying you $7,500 to, to, uh, to take. I mean, this is just a, a remarkable line of subsidies. The entire thing is built on car, uh, House of Cards. Yeah, I've, I've joked that Enron accountants Bernie Madoff and Sam Bankman Freed would blush at the accounting <laughs> gimmicks that are used here. But there's this multiplier that if you're an electric vehicle manufacturer, then you get a credit per gallon and Tesla's are rated at, to be about 65 miles per gallon equivalent. Well, just it's not 65. Let's multiply it times 6.67 and will give Tesla credits for that. So they get credits for nearly 500 miles a gallon. Well, they have all these extra credits because they can meet the corporate average fuel economy standards set by the federal government. And so what do they do? Nearly $2 billion in revenue to Tesla is brought on by companies like General Motors and Ford and other automobile manufacturers that can't meet the government requirements. So they buy these credits. Again, it's just an accounting gimmick. No one's improving a fuel economy because they're having to so heavily invest in technology that people really don't want. But Tesla is reaping a windfall and, and rightfully so. I mean, they're taking advantage of a system out there uh, designed to benefit them and push everyone to electric vehicles. It's unfortunate that anytime we buy an internal combustion engine vehicle, we're paying for those costs, and it's nearly $20,000 per electric vehicle sold is being pushed onto those of us that buy gasoline and diesel vehicles. Yeah, and look, and I understand, like, from an Elon Musk perspective, it's a smart business move, I guess, to maximize money, but it, it really is just a redistribution of wealth. They're just taking money, destroying great American companies, and forcing them to spend billions of dollars on nothing, uh, and then they're all complaining, well, how come you guys can't get on the electric vehicle bandwagon? It, do it doesn't make any sense. I want to point people to a, a, a chart from your uh, study. 
that came out last year in October, I believe. These are the subsidies and regulatory credits accrued by um, electric vehicle over 10 years. And the breakdown's amazing. You have federal and state EV buyer tax credits and rebates, uh, avoided charging infrastructure costs, incremental generation <laughs> transmission and distribution costs, California and other state zero electric uh, uh, zero emission vehicle mandates and credits, EPA GHG multiplier credits, corporate a- uh, average fuel uh, economy, the CAFE credits we've been talking about. Put all these together over a 10-year period, which is, if you're lucky, the life of your electric vehicle, the total is $48,698 in subsidies. I mean, that's almost the entire cost of the car, and we're all paying for that. This is insanity. Yes, Stu, and I published with the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and we update that research later this year. You're going to see those numbers increase significantly, which is quite alarming. You've got wealthy individuals buying electric vehicles, but it's the poor people that are paying for them. And that's what's crushing those the most. It's just these costs from higher taxes, higher regulations. But you look at the electricity that that are nearly $20,000 in the cost baked into an electric vehicle is the upgrading the infrastructure. You get an electric vehicle that's charging at a supercharging station, they're pulling the equivalent electricity off the grid that it takes to run a small grocery store. You get four of them charging, they're pulling the equivalent electricity that powers a Walmart super center. That is a massive, massive amount of electricity. There is no way that we're going to be anywhere near Biden's ambitions of having everyone in electric vehicles by 2030 or 2032 because we don't have the reliable electricity. And these things go hand in hand. The Biden administration is attacking our thermal, reliable generation from natural gas and American coal uh, and decimating that industry to prop up variable, unreliable sources of alternative energy, namely wind and solar. Mm, It's amazing. And now you mentioned the uh, electricity grid, which I think quite clearly we are not prepared for a a country that has 70 or 80 percent of its cars electric, not to mention the fleets of trucks that are supposedly coming as well. Uh, that's one of the things. We, we've also seen a study recently that said that the guardrail system of the United States is not at all prepared for the weight of many of these vehicles. There's a lot of stuff that we're not prepared for. What else should we be looking for that is going to fall through the cracks once all this stuff happens, if it happens? Well, it was interesting when Gavin Newsom said that he was banning the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles right around the same time there was a hurricane that was hitting Florida. I thought for sure Governor DeSantis would come out and ban the sale of electric vehicles because what you were seeing is these as the floodwaters were receding, these cars were catching on fire in garages and they weren't just taking down the car and the garage, they were taking down the house. They were taking down neighbors' homes. So the threat of these, what I'm seeing moving forward is I've seen cities now that are enacting bans of no charging stations in parking garages because of the threat of the fire and the charging that you just don't put out the fire, you have to let it burn. Fire departments are not equipped for this. It's frightening that Kamala Harris is out you know, telling people they need to electrify their school buses. I wouldn't want any of my kids riding on an electric school bus. You know, that that's just way too dangerous. They go up quick, they catch on fire, and they burn at really hot temperatures, and there's no putting them out. Mm. Also, the weight. When we saw the bridge collapse in Baltimore, the first thing I thought was maybe there was too many electric vehicles on that bridge. <laughs> that wasn't the case, but we're not far from there. Our infrastructure is not designed for the weight of these vehicles. Uh, they Thousands of pounds more in parking garages they, they, there are some that are starting to restrict even having electric vehicles in their garages because they weren't designed or engineered for that amount of weight in a parking garage. So uh, troubling times coming ahead if the, the Biden administration is successful in forcing everyone down this because it's just going to be COVID lockdowns 2.0. They want us locked down in our homes where we can't get around, and that's what's going to happen. Uh, you mentioned uh, how the numbers you projected for these subsidies are probably going to go up on this year. I, I would assume a lot of that has to do with the, parts of the Inflation Reduction Act kicking in. Now, of course, we were pitched this as a way to reduce inflation uh, until it passed. Then they told us it was the biggest green uh, bill in the, in the history. There's so much hidden in here and so much people aren't talking about inside the Re- Inflation Re- Reduction Act. How much of this uh, increase is going to be because of that bill? Uh, It's going to be pretty significant. I think there's already been $7 billion that have been allocated towards building supercharging stations around the country, and there's been one that has been built to date. (laughs) They've built one station or $1 billion? 
<laughs> one station in Ohio has been built with over $7 billion <laughs> of Inflation Reduction Act money. If it's an act by Congress, you better just bet that it's going to do the opposite. It's like the Affordable Care Act. What's happened? Healthcare is becoming less and less affordable. Uh, that's what's happening with the Inflation Continuation Act. And it's, it is really the Green New Deal. And the only people that are getting wealthy on it are those coastal elites uh, that are, that, and really the CCP. I mean, you look at this energy transition, it's just a transition of producing reliable, affordable energy in the United States to producing and transitioning that production to China. Uh, it, it's The industrialization is not far behind, and that's what's happened in the United Kingdom, and that's what's happened in Germany, and we need to put a stop to it. And that's why I've, I've founded the American Energy Institute to push back against things like ESG and DEI and stand for free markets and not bend the knee, not feed the crocodiles, as Churchill had claimed to, to appease people. Uh, we are actually going to you know, be the ones that you know, eat, wear the crocodiles. We're not feeding the crocodiles. Uh, Jason, we've got about 30 seconds left. Is there any hope that the market just wins out here, that, uh, that gas-powered cars, which are obviously what people mostly want, just wind up winning and these, these government, the government has to reverse itself? It happened in the initial uh, situation with electric cars in California all those years ago. Uh, can it happen again? It can happen again, but we really need some policy changes to level the playing field. When it comes to electric generation, we need to eliminate the production tax credit, and Congress needs to listen if they want affordable, reliable electricity for the people that they serve. And on the electric vehicle side, we need to eliminate this multiplier. Co companies should get credit for what they do, and that's building cars and build them safe and affordable, and American consumers and American businesses will react, and they'll buy cars again. Right now, people are extending those purchase periods off for as long as possible because they're becoming so much more unaffordable. Mm. Jason Isaac, former Texas state representative, founder of the American Energy Institute. Jason, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks, Stu. Voters are saying immigration is still the top issue facing the country. And of course, Biden is doing a terrible job on that particular topic. That's not me saying that. That's the pollsters. Um, 36% of respondents said immigration is the biggest issue. 33% said inflation and price increases are the top issues facing the United States. Now, it's possible if you if you want to look at this and maybe not and decrease its importance a little bit. The third issue is economy and jobs at 23%. So if you kind of combine inflation plus economy and jobs, they kind of go hand in hand. You're up over you know 59%. So still, that's probably, I mean, the economy is probably number one, but uh, immigration is right there. And nobody likes Joe Biden on immigration. He is not doing a very, just 36% said they approved of his handling of immigration. And of course, when you are looking at this and saying, oh, well, uh, you know, immigration is a problem. We don't want to encourage people to come here. How could all of this have happened despite, you know, Joe Biden being on the stage at the debate saying everyone is welcome here? Um, you know, we know the incentive structure that brings illegal immigrants to the United States. Well, uh, New York City is going to increase that. Uh, they are handing out prepaid debit cards to migrants in what some say is a controversial program. How dare you program could be a boon for the t a tech startup um, which is uh, a, a, an interesting uh, c combo here mobile uh, mobility capital finance uh, they uh, are going to get 1.8 million dollars uh, theoretically by taking a cut on the funds to load money onto each mastercard how many times when's the last time someone gave you a prepaid mastercard like was it today Yesterday, like what what day was it? Was it two weeks ago? Maybe did you have you had to wait two weeks as a citizen to get a prepaid MasterCard from your city? Was it a month ago? When was the last time they gave you one? Two months ago? Was it six months ago? They gave you a prepaid MasterCard. What day was it? Do you remember? Was it Christmas? Thanksgiving? Was it last Easter? Did you get a prepaid MasterCard from your city? No, never. Not once in your whole life ever. Huh? It's weird how that works. Now, you think maybe. The actual answer is to cut government, slice it down to the bone. Well, that's what they're doing in uh, uh, Arge Argentina. Excuse me. Uh, Javier Millet is planning to fire 70,000 government, government workers in the coming months in one of the clearest signs yet uh, on how the libertarian's chainsaw-like approach intends to slash the swollen state. It's according to Yahoo Finance. Uh, 
he's actually doing this down there, which is interesting because I didn't know what to make of the guy. Honestly, he comes on. He's a big talker. He went on TV and says a lot of things. But we have a lot of pundits here that have done that. Many of them have gone into politics. And when they go into politics, gee, it doesn't seem like the exact same person. Uh, but Malay seems to continue to be doing this and seems to actually be implementing these things. This could lead to short-term tough times in Argentina, and it's going to be interesting to see if he can get over that hump. But we watch very closely, as this is one of the biggest, uh, I mean, economic experiments we've seen in quite some time going on in Argentina. You know, as conservatives, we've had to suffer through the left-wing media establishment, especially in entertainment, for such a long time. We're so used to it. At times, we don't even notice it anymore. Um, and a lot of the efforts on the conservative side for a very long time sort of just sucked, uh, frankly. Uh, that's changing in a big way. We, we talked about Cabrini on the serious side uh, lately, which just, uh, you know, just a great story and really well done. Um, and it, we also need that to happen not only on the serious side, but also on the comedy side. Uh, one of the things we've been working on, we've released a couple of these over the past couple of years, and we have a new effort in this uh, area. It's called Agua Donkeys. Now, this is not some message movie. It is just freaking funny. It's just a funny movie. It has no, you're, you're not going to get any message on lower taxes out of it. it but it's, you know, it's very much not woke. Uh, and hilarious. This is something that it's not just us in on. Like we, we've seen multi-billion dollar streaming companies chasing after this thing. Uh, it's really, really funny. If you love a Napoleon Dynamite or some of the Christopher Guest stuff, that dry sort of sense of humor, if you like that type of thing, you're going to love Agua Donkeys. It's part of your Blaze TV subscription. It's available right now. Here's a preview. Who is it? It's the Agua... Donkeys? Oh, the pool boys. Mm -hmm. Jer can hold his breath for six minutes. How did you not pass out? I did pass out. MP right. is not gay. How's it going, Agua Donkeys? My buddy got his puka shell necklace stuck in your drain. Can you do CPR on him? I would, but I'm not gay. Jackie. Jackie? Is the girl of their dreams. Sorry, is that a B as in boy or D as in doy? And Rod. At Agua Donkeys, you can't ask out Jackie. Um, uh, what are you guys wearing? What? Is trying to run a business. I'm trying to run a business here. Oh, sorry, you broke up, dude. I didn't hear like the last five minutes of what you said. But the pool boys have a plan. Get abs, get calves. Dude, I wish you could see how slick your calves are looking right now. And jump off the roof of the Sleepy Seagull. To be honest, I didn't even know this place had a roof. Blaze TV presents a silky, sick, and buttery, it's so buttery, dumb comedy film. It's so dumb. Pull your shirts down. Featuring one f bomb. That was probably one of the only times I've ever said the f word. So which one do you want to date? It? We both do individually. Two suitors. How does that work? Johnny. Donny. 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 And Donny. M.P. Cunningham and Jer Jackson play M.P. Cunningham and Jer Jackson Whoa. in the most exciting pool-related comedy of the year. Yeah, my buddy says you have a pool. Agua Donkeys. They're not going to hit them. So here's what happened. In Pittsburgh, gas station, a fight broke out. A customer threw a banana at the gas station employee. Uh, then the customer and staff began throwing multiple bananas back and forth at each other. That's not necessarily good. It then escalated into a bigger fight. A punch was thrown. Then the employee chased the customer out into the parking lot and hit him over the head several times with a PVC pipe. Shockingly, this banana incident has led to uh, hospitalization and charges being filed. So this is not necessarily, I, I will say this, this does show you should never eat a gas station banana. That I, will, uh, I can tell you from, uh, from experience, unfortunately. By the way, uh, Blaze TV merch is available, studosmerch.com. Joe Biden, elderly man with a poor memory. You can get it now. Use the code STU10.